enjoy being here. Uh, kind of Columbia, when I wrote the Tannenbaum book, I was a visiting scholar here at Columbia, but not in your department. I was over in the sociology department. Uh, so I had a lot of fun uh, doing this piece. Um, and, and as you know, uh, Frank uh, had two uh, academic histories. Uh, he had the one that you know, which was a professor of the Latin American history at Columbia in the history department, right over there. Uh, and he had one that you don't know as well, uh, an early one, which kind of framed him a lot uh, and is of interest to me uh, as a uh, professor of criminologia uh, up in uh, Canada. And also, uh, uh, my uh, undergraduate work was done here in the States at Berkeley uh, and also at the State University of New York at Albany. So, uh, and I did my PhD at, uh, in Canada. So I was interested in the first part, the primero. Um, and I was interested in it for a number of reasons that I'm going to get into and uh, illustrate for you. Uh, so this is a, a picture of Frank. And there is a, uh, a, a very, very a significant picture, not for you, unfortunately, but for those people in American uh, corrections. This is a picture of a very young Frank Tannenbaum. He's about the 22 uh, años, más o menos. Uh, he's right outside Sing Sing Penitentiary with the warden, uh, who is uh, Thomas Mott Osborne. That's significant because Osborne was a major prison reformer uh, in the United States uh, and was uh, Frank's mentor in all things kind of criminology-wise, so uh, that's kind of significant there. Uh, anyway, that was, uh, okay, am I doing this right? Go yeah. back, I guess. Back? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's a, a picture of, uh, of Frank. This is one of his early Columbia pictures uh, that uh, uh, you may have seen uh, in the archives. And here you go with some of his, his uh, things that he did. Now, the reason why Frank Tannenbaum is significant in early American criminological thought is because he made a number of conclusions that were at odds with the prevailing orthodoxy in criminology. What was that prevailing orthodoxy? It was about uh, the assumption of innate evil. It was about pathology. It was about phrenology, you know, ears, size of head, nose. Uh, um, it, Basically, that the United States was still under the influence of what they called a criminal anthropology around the turn of the century. And it was only uh, with the Chicago School uh, critiquing that and people like Frank. So he was an early uh, labeling theorist. And he, he made an argument that, uh, that the criminal justice process had this labeling effect on people that kept them in criminal streams. Um, and and that, that was a process there that was very difficult to break out of. Um, and then, of course, here is, a, uh, uh, here is his critique of pathology, right? Here he's saying that a crime is not caused by inferiority, psych physiological or psychological. And he completely repudiated that. That was was a kind of a notion. And then he went on to say uh, <clears throat> that the delinquent was responding, and this is now, this is stuff that he was doing. He actually wrote the book, Crime and, and the Community, by the way. He wrote the book around uh, the late, early 1930s. It took him a while to get it published for a variety of reasons. But So this is work that he was doing in the 20s and early 30s. And here he is making an argument that uh, delinquency, you have to understand the stimuli and the context in which delinquents are uh, engaging in, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, he was a, uh, he critiqued the old cell block system of the United States uh, penitentiary. Remember, well, you, you may not know this, but the United States had two prisons, prison models. One was the Pennsylvania model. Mm -hmm. The Pennsylvania model originally was solitary confinement. 
and then there was the New York model, which is based out of Auburn. And the Auburn model was conjugate labor, that is the, uh, the inmates were released from their cells to, late, to do labor, but there was a silent system in effect. And uh, that system uh, essentially took over throughout the United States and Canada as the model system, and then they abolished uh, uh, the silent system, they abolished the stripes, and uh, you, know, you know all of that, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially, one of the things that he says very early on, uh, 1925, and this is after about 10 years after he had his prison experience, which I'm gonna get into. Uh, he makes an argument that is uh, uh, really missed even today. And the argument that he makes is that the prison system generates and uh, solidifies people's criminal careers. And that you have to look at, if you're going to analyze a criminal career for a recidivist, right? You have to look at their prison experiences and the reformatory experiences as formative, creating it. In other words, this is a, 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 a critique, an etogenic critique of the prison system. That the prison system essentially created the, these kinds of individuals. So early Frank, uh, here he was born, as many of you know already, in uh, uh, 1893. We don't know the exact date because his mother estimated it. Uh, they, they immigrated to uh, uh, the United States in the early part of this, the, uh, the uh, 20th century. The father had already been here. He was a farmer. Frank was the oldest. Uh, he was a rambunctious young guy. Not a very tall individual, by the way. Uh, but uh, kind of a wild guy. Uh, Frank did not want to become a farmer in upper state New York. He was not that interested in it. So he ran away from the farm uh, at the age of 13 with about 75 cents in his pocket and took the train down to New York City uh, and found a place in the Bowery, a little place to rent and uh, uh, etc. Uh, worked as, uh, as anybody would with a kid who didn't have much of an education. Uh, elevator operator, a dishwasher, anything he could, could get. And he had uh, his uh, books. His one dream of uh, being down in New York City was uh, to get an education. Uh, that's one of the reasons he escaped his father's farm. He didn't want to be an, an illiterate farmer for the rest of his career. So uh, Frank uh, became involved in the IWW. This is of interest to you as uh, Latin American historians. This is one of the American indigenous radical unions, international workers of the world. Uh, they were heavily influenced by anarchist uh, uh, ideology, not so much formal Marxist ideology, but uh, certainly anarchist ideology. He became a member. Uh, there was a very harsh winter in 1913-14, very cold outside, uh, maybe 500,000 people unemployed, uh, 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 easily two to 300 people homeless. If you can imagine that, the city of New York. Uh, the city set up barges for them to sleep uh, and other places. Uh, and he, uh, as, a, as an IWW uh, person, uh, decided that he would organize the, the unemployed and the homeless. So Frank was one of your first occupiers, right? <laughs> yeah? Uh, was, what is that in Spanish? Ocupado? Mm, no. Ocupas. Ocupas. Ocupas? He was one of the first people. He would lead a hundred or so or 200 unemployed men into church or a church and demand housing and food. And most of the churches at that time were, were willing to give, give the, the unemployed that, that setting. The problem, of course, of doing this was that uh, uh, Frank became uh, very, very notorious in the mainstream media, right? in the uh, periodicos, you know. Uh, he was getting a lot of attention in the New York Times. The establishment was not happy with this 
kind of proto-revolutionary activity. Uh, unemployed people scared of uh, corporate people. So uh, there's a lot of attention there, a lot of uh, uh, et cetera. A part of what he was doing was trying to recruit the unemployed into the IWW. He's demanding an eight hour uh, day and decent wages. So there's a union aspect to what Frank was doing with the homeless uh, in terms of what he was up to. Well, um, as you might expect, uh, the mayor and the police chief were under tremendous pressure from uh, business and corporate interests in New York City to do something about this kid who was causing havoc. Uh, so they uh, had him arrested while occupying a Catholic church. And while he was inside negotiating with the, the bishop uh, to allow his men to come in uh, to the Catholic Church, they had uh, rounded up 10 paddy wagons outside the church and arrested about 190 people, including Frank, uh, uh, which is kind of interesting. Here is a picture. This is on the, the, the uh, cover of the book. This is uh, Frank's arrest picture. And the two guys you see to the uh, right are New York City detectives with Bulger hats on who were assigned to uh, make this happen, okay? In other words, arrest Frank. So Frank gets hauled off as well as some other people. Uh, and he decides, for better or worse, uh, to uh, go to trial. Now, that may have been a tactical error, but he decides to go to trial to make this a show trial about poverty and the unemployed. No question. Uh, um, how come a person alone became so visible? I mean, did he have people working with him? or? Oh, yeah, he had the IWW, but it was Frank's idea to, to put this to occupy the churches. I see. And, and they let him do that. Um, I mean, uh, you know. What is the IWW? International Workers of the World. I see. So yeah. he got the support of that. Oh, yeah. He got some support of that, a little okay. bit of help. But basically, this is kind of Frank's project. Okay. He came so up with this idea okay. in uh, around January or February of 1914. And then he put it into effect in late February and early March. So by the time he got arrested on March the 4th, right, he had already occupied about a half dozen churches to success, you know, getting money for the men uh, and a place to stay. So anyway, a misdemeanor trial. Grand jury refused to indict him on felonies. Uh, he was tried on misdemeanors. Uh, Four-day trial covered with the press coverage was extensive here. I mean, we're talking to major newspapers again. Uh, he's convicted by a jury. Uh, and he's sentenced to one year on Blackwell's Island. Now, you probably don't know this, but Roosevelt Island, does anybody mm -hmm. live yeah, there? No, no live no. no. Well, but that we used to be a prison island. Okay. And I will show you a picture of Blackwell Penitentiary in a minute. But that used to be called Blackwell's Island, and it was a prison island where you went if you were convicted of, uh, of a municipal, you know, a local offense. Uh, a year or less, as opposed to going to state penitentiary to Sing Sing or some other place like that. So uh, he was sentenced to this famous old penitentiary. You can see that penitentiary dated to uh, 1832. Okay, so this is a real old place. I'll show you some photographs of my research. Here is Frank's closing statement to the judge before sentencing. Uh, a little recommendation here. If you don't want to go to jail, do not make this kind of a speech. Uh, I'll just read you part of it. The day I, here's what he says to the judge. The day I was brought into court, justice flew out the window and never came back. Your jurymen never take the circumstances, the passions, the feelings of the men into consideration. These boys are more spontaneous, they are more human, I think, than other people, so they can't adapt themselves to this rotten system. He's talking to the judge now, okay? This is my last trial. If I'm ever arrested again, there will be no more trials. You couldn't get a jury of working men to convict me. These gentlemen on the jury are members of your class. 
They are capitalists in miniature. <laughs> so now you understand why the judge threw the book at him, okay? Yeah. So here's uh, a picture of Blackwell's Island. Uh, this was on, this was this old, uh, very large penitentiary. Uh, this comes from the, these prints come from the uh, New York Public Library down on 42nd Street. If you've ever been there, it's a gorgeous building, right? It's absolutely wonderful. Here's some, in, some inside shots of a uh, jail uh, around that particular period of time. This is the late 1800s. Uh, people a, being, a drawing or a picture? A drawing. Yeah. This is an etching. An etching. etching. Yeah, yeah, an etching. I just thought I'd give you a little flavor for this. No, uh, here's another uh, uh, picture inside of the, of a, you know, there was no plumbing at that time, so you, you dropped your, uh, your plumbing in, a, in a various places, and, uh, et cetera. So Frank did a year um, of lockup, and uh, then he gets released uh, in basically uh, 1915. Okay, he's done one straight year, and he's out in the free world. He's still a radical. Uh, they welcome him back down at Cooper's Union. Uh, his uh, anarchist and IWW friends. Uh, there's some press coverage on him. Uh, he starts writing about prisons and the masses. Uh, uh, his experiences there. Uh, a, a particular, some wealthy people felt sorry for him due to the press coverage, right? And they helped him with uh, some other people that got him into Columbia. Now, this is interesting. Uh, Frank had no high school diploma. So he came into Columbia as a special student. Uh, and they got him in. And uh, still writing about prisons during this time, uh, studying political <coughs> science and uh, history. Uh, ended up being a very, very good student, by the way. Frank uh, was an exceptional student, according to his profs. He graduates uh, in June of 1921, uh, a couple years, a year or two later than most of his students. Most of the students at Columbia had no clue who Frank was. They had no clue about his radical past or his anarchism or IWW, nothing, they knew nothing about. Uh, so he starts, he writes a book. This is a fairly uh, interesting book. This is a book called Wall Shadows about his year of do in prison in, in Blackwell's Island. He wrote the book. So think about this. Um, he just graduated from Columbia in 21, right? He writes a book and gets it published in 1922. That's the kind of uh, guy Frank was. He was a very, very uh, industrious, productive guy. Well, you know that from your own work, right? How many books in Latin American history are we talking about? Ten? Is, is it about that? I believe it is. It's close to that. It's a lot. Uh, and a lot of those books were republished in Spanish. They were translated. I mean, Tannenbaum was, in Colombia, was uh, Mr. Latin American history. And he was so famous that he had a huge table in his office. And you know the history of that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he would have uh, various uh, uh, people from uh, the Latin American states. They were either ex-diplomats. Some of them were deposed presidents. And they would have this seminar in Spanish in his office. Um, it was quite famous. He did that for years. So here's a picture. He's writing articles on prisons. Uh, he's a fan of, of Warden Thomas Mott Osborne. Uh, Osborne invites him over for a little tour of Sing Sing in 1916. So here's Frank standing outside uh, uh, the range in Sing Sing Penitentiary uh, being shown uh, a cell in the old cell block. Um, so uh, Frank gets married in 1917 to an Esther Abramson. They have two children in the 1920s. 
Uh, Frank finishes his doctorate at uh, the Brookings Institution in 27. Frank wasn't a particularly good husband. Uh, he was away a lot. Uh, when his two kids were born, he wasn't there in New York City, to give you an idea. Uh, so uh, he writes about the Mexican agricultural system and, and the revolution. Uh, he works as a journalist and a paid speaker. Uh, he's an old stump speaker. Uh, and he does something that a lot of you probably don't know about. Uh, he works for the famous Wickersham Commission, which was a commission on uh, law enforcement and the administration of justice uh, in the United States, uh, particularly after, after the, the effects of prohibition. And so he's, he becomes a reporter on that and essentially writes their report on prisons. Uh, back to Columbia, he's hired as a lecturer here uh, in 1935. He does some teaching up at uh, uh, a couple universities uh, uh, in New York State in criminology. But what happens is, is that one of the professors in the history department uh, uh, retires in Latin American history, and they hire Frank do, to become a professor there. And he starts out in the political science department, 1935. That is his uh, picture. Here's his picture uh, right there uh, well, he's, as a young professor at Columbia. Uh, but while he's at Columbia, <coughs> before he's at Columbia, he publishes a book on Osborne called Osborne of Sing Sing. No. Uh, and in the famous book, uh, Crime in the Community, 1938. Crime in the Community is quite interesting because those quotes that I showed you in the beginning of this little mini lecture are all from that book. And they represented a very significant departure in American thinking about crime. Uh, he was certainly not a mainstream uh, thinker about crime. So anyway, there's his uh, picture. Uh, he's, he's talking in 1944, uh, this is his critique of the prison system, that our methods of punishment do not reduce the number of crimes committed, nor improve the way of life of the imprisoned. Uh, recidivism is conspicuous, especially for those who were first to be reformed by the initial incarceration. So here he is, uh, you know, from his experience of being locked up and then writing about it, is what I'm getting into this theme about being a convict criminologist, right? And the significance of that, uh, that, that experience, how it significantly changed his thinking about crime and why he became a critique. And a major, actually a major American penologist in the early part of the 20th century, up to about 1940. And Frank Tannenbaum was considered by some to be one of the three most significant penologists in the early uh, early 20th century in the United States. You didn't know that, did you? You, you know, this is nothing that you would who would know. I mean, you're Latin American scholars who would know, right? So there is a picture of uh, Frank. This is his university photo. You recognize that, right? Uh, and uh, uh, this is probably was, was shot in the, in the 1950s, I'd say late, late 1950s became his universe, university photo. Here's his epilogue, uh, born approximately 19, 1893, uh, died of cancer in 69. He had retired from Columbia in 61. But he, he was still affiliated uh, full-time with the university seminars, which he started. So he ran the university seminars uh, all the way from uh, 61 until he, he passed on in 69. Uh, historically, uh, uh, Frank moved away from uh, a Marxist or socialist history. Uh, he was not persuaded uh, of that analysis. Uh, he became a uh, kind of a, a pluralist, so to speak. Uh, his basic 
uh, argument was that society had to be balanced uh, between family, community, church, and government. And when that balance was out of whack, when that balance among those four four groups was out of bat, out of whack, then you had you had social problems. That was his analysis. Um, um, wrote a, a whole lot of books on Latin American uh, uh, politics. As I said, he founded this institute, and really need to put. You have a lot of posters about Frank. Mm -hmm. You need to put them on the walls. I mean, really, this whole room should have Frank Tannenbaum on it. I mean, you all. You still have that, I think. All the. No, I oh, well, there's a few pictures by, of him. You have, and, uh, you have uh, almost... And the, and the room is called... The room, the room, yeah, the room, room is called that way. You almost have 10 posters of Frank and his... The whole deal, I mean, this, you know, <clears throat> this is quite amazing. Anyway, back to crime. Uh, what was always interesting about Frank was, despite the fact that he changed his perspective on Latin American history, uh, et cetera, et cetera, he never wavered on crime and uh, punishment from day one. Never changed his critique, never changed his perspective, even though he had a, largely abandoned the field. Uh, he was, was uh, opposed to capital punishment, opposed to the large prisons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that's my interest in him um, and my, my interest in, in uh, presenting him to you uh, is that the founder of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia had this unique first career uh, that was, was significant. And, and I believe, had he continued in criminology, Frank would, be, would today be a major figure. He would be on the level of uh, maybe Edwin Sutherland out of the University of Chicago. He would be that kind of guy had he continued to do work in uh, criminology and prisons, had he updated his book, Crime in the Community, would have been a major textbook. It was used as a major textbook, but he never updated it. So uh, yeah, it's probably, that's probably the case. Uh, just one last slide, uh, and I'll finish up right now. This is, I want to let you know how, how I did this, uh, wrote this book. Uh, it's a standard case study. You, you all use case study methods in your work. Uh, there were two uh, major sites here at Columbia. Uh, one of them is the Butler Library, has a hundred boxes of Frank stuff. Frank was a great pack rat. I don't know, what is the word in Spanish for pack rat? Right? Ratoncito de biblioteca. Okay. The same translation. The man never threw anything away. <laughs> so there's a whole lot of stuff at the Butler Library. Most of it's off-site. And then there is a small collection in the archives of the university seminar in the basement mm -hmm. that you know about. And that's also a, a site for a, a Tannenbaum, a lot of photographs, uh, photographias are there. Uh, so those are the two major collection points. And then there was some other stuff around that you, know, you could look at, you know, but it wasn't particularly productive. Uh, what was productive were the newspapers, uh, etc. Now in the course of doing this piece of research, uh, I tried to be innovative in terms of methods, and you'll find this interesting. I found uh, that Frank had given up his children, his, his two kids, that they were adopted by his ex-wife and her new husband. So this happened. Frank got a Mexican divorce in 1929, and it's in the papers, it's in Spanish, in the papers. Uh, and so he got a divorce, and these kids were adopted in 31, 1931 in the Bronx. And I had to track down where the file was. I started in Manhattan, no records. I went to Brooklyn, no records. And finally I got a tip 
through a relative uh, because I had Frank's probate records, right? I could trace those. Uh, we found them in the Bronx. So these are adoption files for his two kids. So if you are a researcher, if you are a historian, and you want to find out about what was happening in somebody's life in 1931, what better source than an adoption file which would have social history in it, right? And who knows what else? So I petitioned the Bronx judge to open up these old, Bronx, these old adoption files. All the principals had passed on. And I had permission from a niece and a nephew of the Tannenbaum family to get access to the file. The judge told me, no, I'm not giving you access to the adoption file. You are a third party. And I don't buy the notion that there is a public interest in doing historical research, notwithstanding a Tannenbaum stature as a you know, criminologist, penologist, convict criminologist. It didn't matter to this judge. So she denied the, the, the petition to open the file in toto and said I did not have standing. So we decided to file an appeal of her decision before the first appellate division here in Manhattan, down in, in a gorgeous old turn of the century uh, uh, courthouse. That's the first appellate division of the New York State Supreme Court. And uh, a panel of five women appellate justices heard our petition and in a one-page decision said, nope, you're not getting access to this file. Period, end of sentence. We don't buy your arguments whatsoever. Bang. So I tried to open up these files for more information on Frank because it was an important period, right? This is 1930-31, and it was right before he became a professor in Columbia. And it's right when he's struggling, uh, you know, as a, as a reporter and a journalist, you know, to, to get a foothold. He's also a, a public speaker. He's speaking on a lot of these things. That is, uh, in but a nutshell... his wife was the mother of his children. Yes. Oh, so... Yes. But he married again. She married again. She got no, divorced. He married, right. uh, he still, married again too. She he married did again, later yeah. on. He married again later on. Yes, but that came. That was well over a decade later, mm -hmm. when he was a professor at Columbia, and uh, you know Margaret Mead was a friend of his, mm -hmm. and she introduced him to his new wife, mm -hmm. who was an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, uh, yeah, and so she traveled with him in Latin America quite a bit. Mm -hmm. He was all over the place. Well, he knew, you know, you know this. He knew President Cardenas, mm -hmm. and he knew all these people. Well, Pers he was involved in Mexico and the yeah. unions, right? Pers personally, I mean, big time. I mean, uh, Tannenbaum is, uh, you know, an extremely interesting individual in Latin American history, written from the American point of view. Right. I mean, uh, even if you don't uh, agree with a lot of some of his observations, you're still, on, on time from time to time, citing him mm -hmm. as a historical reference. Yeah. yeah, you are. I mean, that's one of the reasons you have this institute here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, that is my little spiel on Frank. I have books. I'm selling them at discount for $50. So if you have a checkbook, I'm happy to sell you a, sell you a book. Thank you very much. Yeah. And that's my presentation on uh, on Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.